As any typical 24-year-old, I'm very independent. I have multiple chronic illnesses which disable me, so my independence looks a little different to what yours might. For example, I use a wheelchair when I'm out and about, or in the house if I've got an active injury and can't walk, like a bad hip dislocation. I recently got a new wheelchair, and there's one particular feature I made sure I had, or more accurately, didn't have, because of a situation that has happened to me a lot, and one event that left me fighting for my life. My new chair doesn't have push handles. I've always hated when people lean on my chair, or in public, a stranger just grabs my chair by the push handles and starts trying to help me. If I needed a push, I'd have someone with me. As it is, I have a power assist application called a smart drive. My smart drive has given me my independence back, as I did used to be reliant on others to push me. But now my nifty little fifth wheel does the propelling for me and I can roll alongside my friends, get up hills, and it generally just means I can leave the house alone. But some people see a wheelchair and assume the helpful stranger position and go in for the push. Not only is this incredibly annoying, but rude. How would you feel if you were just minding your own business, crossing a road, and someone started pushing on your legs, or just swung you on top of their shoulders and carried you off? Anyway, I digress. This incident happened back in 2019, so pre-pandemic times, and I was out and about doing some shopping. My old wheelchair had push handles because I hadn't started off with a smart drive, just my manual chair. But at this point, I did have my smart drive, hence me being out by myself. I also have been wearing a mask for longer than the rest of the country due to severe allergic asthma. My main triggers are industrial or environmental particles, sprays, perfumes, and cigarette smoke. So picture this. I'm outside wheeling along on my own, wearing my fog mask, window shopping basically. And then I wasn't. I was whizzing forward. My first thought being that I trapped my waistband accidentally and started the smart drive up, but I very quickly realized someone was pushing me. I tried to hold my push rims to break and turned around to tell them, I'm fine thank you, I don't need a push, and I actually have an electric box that pushes it for me. But this person just didn't care. They started laughing a strange forced laughter, and I became more firm. Seriously, let go, I'm fine. This person didn't bat an eyelid, they didn't give a fuck, they just kept pushing me and said loudly in a patronizing manner. Yes, we're going home now. At this point, we're going pretty fast and heading in a direction I really did not want to go towards on account of it being a very industrial area where I know the traffic is bad, buildings are being demolished for the HS2 railway, and lots of people smoking at bus stops. I still have my mask on, but I start trying to reach out to strangers, shouting for someone to help me. No one did. Everyone shrunk away, staring wide-eyed at the crazy disabled girl in the chair and her poor carer having to rush her home with a variety of excuses. Oh, I told you we don't grab people. Yes, I know we're getting tired and you're overdue for meds. Let's not ruin anyone else's day. Sorry, sorry everyone. She's in a lot of pain and gets hysterical like this as he rushes me past a long line of bus stops several smokers worth of fog beginning to penetrate my mask. Seriously, get the fuck off of my chair. I need my inhaler. Let me go. We kept going and turned down a quieter street where there were literally bulldozers and wrecking balls and the air was thick with dust. I'm getting scared. I'm wheezing. I'm really panicking now as I know we're headed out of town and I have no idea where we are going. Finally, he fucks up, stopping my chair, coming around in front of me, and ripping my mask off, and begins to say, Listen, you little shit. But before he could get any further, I surprised him with a very forceful kick in the crotch. He counted on me being paralyzed, I guess, and didn't count on two things. One, my legs working enough to defend myself, and two, the power of panic and fight or flight when a person's throat is closing up. As he recoiled from the hard kick, 
I did what I've seen people do in films and brought my hands together and down onto his back as hard as I could, which I think winded him as he let out a wheeze almost as loud as my own. He dropped my mask on the floor in his panic, and whilst he was backing away, I reached around to my rucksack to grab my inhaler. I immediately took two puffs whilst he was cursing and screaming at me, but my ears had blocked up and my vision was going funny. A couple of the builders had seen the commotion and come over the road to see what was happening, and I pointed at the man, wheezed out, Help! I don't know him! Before I blacked out. When I came back, I was being lifted onto an ambulance gurney with paramedics and a builder around me. The man who had commandeered my chair was gone, and I had a nebulizer and oxygen blasting through a mask over my mouth and nose. I have never been so glad to take a breath. My vision was still swimming, and I felt like I'd been jabbed hard in my throat and couldn't really squeeze any words out. They loaded my chair onto the ambulance, and then we went off to the hospital. When the builders came over and I blacked out, one of them saw my inhaler, saw that my lips were blue, heard my wheezing and immediately called 999, and the guy who'd almost killed me took off. Another builder tried to chase after him, but he didn't catch up and the guy got away. The one who'd called the ambulance came with me to the hospital, and I've since become good friends with him. My family will forever credit him for saving my life that day. The police came to see me whilst I was still in hospital and had me report what they called an attempted kidnapping. Kidnapping. At the time I hadn't even thought about what the outcome might have been, but once the police had talked with me, I realized how lucky I truly was. That man could have done anything to me, and if he'd picked someone who couldn't use their legs, it could have ended very differently. They spoke to the builder who chased after the kidnapper, but they were never able to catch him or even ID him. In terms of the wonderful Leroy, the police and my asthma nurse commended him on his quick thinking, and I bubbled with his family during the pandemic. Leroy, thank you for saving my life that day. And kidnapper, let's not meet again. At 19, I was hired for the role of a correctional officer. I was one of the youngest there at the time, working at the most dangerous prison in Australia. I had worked there for 40 years, seven days a fortnight, 12-hour shifts. While it sounded like a pretty laid-back role, easy money really, the toll it takes on the mind is unimaginable, to the point where no money could encourage me to redo my time working there. There were good times where the men I worked with would better themselves and make something out of their lives afterwards, but I saw all manner of things, from courtyard fights to someone playing with themselves in public, to murder and people ending themselves, but none of that is what stuck with me through my time there. You would think so, but no, the one thing that stuck with me in my time there was a short-lived and supernatural experience. There was not a single drop of blood spilled during this experience, yet it was one of the most horrific and graphic things I have ever witnessed. It was a night shift. The shift started at 7 p.m. and finished at 7 a.m. We rarely did night shifts, and this was my first one since finishing training. What usually was a staff of about 200 people had dwindled down to about 30 by 10 p.m. We weren't left alone per se, but we generally did rounds on our own every hour or so. I was prepared and ready to take on the night, and being the youngest on the team and presumably the most naive, there were rounds of light-hearted teasing directed towards me. You'll have aged to 60 by the end of the night. Be aware of the night crazies, young Padawan. The start of the shift was quiet, peaceful almost. No issues, no weird bumps in the night. The inmates were quiet, dead asleep in their cells. It was probably around four in the morning. Tiredness was really starting to sink in, 
when I saw a figure shift out of the corner of my eye, just outside of the unit. At that point, I just brushed it off as being sleep deprived and left to myself while the other staff members did their rounds. However, when I saw the figure move back to where it first initially moved from, my alarm bells started going off quietly at this point. I turned in my chair to face the windows that looked out into the courtyard and focused my eyes on where I saw the figure move to, attempting to peer through the darkness. I saw it, just a shadow, but there was something there. Now, usually if we saw something strange, we should radio it in, in case it was a loose inmate, but this wasn't a human figure so I put it down to maybe being an animal, which, as large as it was, was incredibly unlikely. This was a maximum security prison. Nothing larger than a rat should be getting in. It took my tired brain longer than it should have to process this information. The alarm bells, that just moments before were a simple quiet whisper of something may be wrong, were now blaring. My now fatigued mind and body were awake, every nerve burning, ready to take action. I leaned over to the control panel and flipped on the outside lights. Nothing, nothing was there. Just me and my embarrassing labored breathing filling the unit. My radio cracked. My supervisor had seen the lights flipped on from the unit that she was currently doing rounds in. I had told her I thought I'd seen something moving outside, but it was most likely just my eyes playing tricks on me. She laughed back and said something that caused my skin to break out into a chilled sweat. We said to be careful of the night crazies. This is a lonely time and the crazies are lively tonight. Really, it's a sentence that doesn't entirely make sense. Unless crazies was a descriptive word of someone or the name of something. I brushed it off as her and the team trying to spook the literal new kid on the block, but still... Something lingered inside of me that told me that something was not right. I had half an hour of tainted peace before the next encounter with this shadow. Except this time, it wasn't outside. It had started as simple quiet tapping. Maybe it was the wind, but it's coming from the inside. Well, then maybe it's one of the inmates awake and bored. During the day, the inmates would cause a muck if they were confined to their cells, from tapping to banging to blood-curdling screams. The thing was, after a few minutes of thought, it was coming from one of the unoccupied cells. I was still alone at this point, but my unit partner should have been arriving back soon after finishing their rounds. I had stared at the cell door for a few minutes, trying to determine what to do, when the tapping sound suddenly stopped. My previously furrowed brow softened into a picture of surprise, but mostly relief. Almost immediately after relaxing, the scraping started. A long, painful sound, like someone drawing their nails across a blackboard. I cringed at the sound initially, but then panic took over. It wasn't a loud and deafening sound, but it was there. It was happening, when it shouldn't have been. I racked my brain on what to do. Radio in. Strange noise coming from unoccupied cell, going to investigate. My unit partner gave their affirmations and reported that they would only be a few more minutes. That it's probably nothing and that I don't need to wait for them to check in on the cell. I wished they'd asked me to wait. I stood there and then walked over to the cell in a daze. Not even a single hesitation. This outward confidence was at war with my insides, my heart pounding, my brain screaming for me to stop, and my lungs burning for air. My stomach was tied up in knots, and even with these warnings that something was terribly, terribly wrong behind that door, I didn't stop myself reaching for the latch. I opened the door. I hadn't turned on the cell light. They all turn on at the same time, and I didn't want to wake the inmates. The only light poured in from the central unit, my shape blocking most of it, letting a few dim streams through. I stepped in. I don't know why. We aren't allowed to step into a cell before inspecting it, but I did it anyway. 
I stepped inside and into the corner to let more light in, and I saw it. It was facing away from me, a crouched humanoid figure. Its skin was a sickly green-gray color, its knees bent forward, the kneecaps facing towards me. Its limbs were long and skinny, its joints large bulbs protruding from underneath its skin. It didn't even acknowledge me. It just raised its long arms up above its head, placed the tips of its grotesque digits against the concrete wall of the cell, and ever so slowly dragged its fingers down. I'd been silent up until this point. The fingers were halfway down its path when I let out a small gasp. It paused just for a second, then it started to stand, its perverted knees cracking as it did. I was frozen. Its head was set on a dangerously long neck that was almost the length of its demented body. It had to stoop so that its head wouldn't hit the roof. Then it started to turn. But just before I saw its face, the room went black. The door had shut and I crumbled to the floor, screaming for what felt like hours. But in reality, it was only 30 seconds according to my partner who had ran to open the cell door. I was sent home early that day. I expected to hear something about it when I went back into work, but there was nothing. Not even light-hearted teasing. It was like nothing had ever happened. A few months after the event, when I'd finally settled back into a normal routine, I did some research on the prison. Many old Australian prisons had wretched pasts filled with torture. This particular prison was notorious for it back in the day. Abuse, torture, hangings and riots. I wish I had not researched the history of the prison I worked at, because up until that point, I convinced myself that I was simply sleep deprived, although that doesn't explain the cell door closing shut and locking. For the most part, the research brought up nothing too daunting, just the typical graphic and gruesome history of Australian prisons. However, I unearthed a diary entry that was written by a man from those dark times, and one of his last entries really put the nail in the coffin for me. It stayed burned in my mind for these last 40 years. This is what his entry said. The walls we tap to make song are the same walls we scratch. Our nights are loops, and our hunger destroys our truths. They break our legs, and for daylight we beg. Instead, they stretch out our necks with their noose. Hey, this is my first ever post on here. I just wanted to share a couple of creepy and strange encounters in my hometown in Ontario, Canada. This first encounter that specifically haunts me to this day happened three years ago in the summer of 2019. I was 16 at the time. I'm a pretty big, built guy, but I'm not the most confident when it comes to encountering some of the nutters you can encounter in Ontario. I was walking home from my local grocery store after going on a late night snack run as I had plans of just gaming late with a couple of buddies that evening. This isn't a super long story, but basically, I was about halfway home when I had noticed this homeless guy on a bike that seemed to be following me. I had recognized him before, as funnily enough, about nine months earlier, I had purchased him a coffee and a bagel during the winter months from my local Tim Hortons, so I figured maybe he recognized me. I glanced back a couple of times, and it noticed he was still on me. I crossed an empty parking lot, and I felt like he'd gotten closer. And he had. He was speeding up and was coming in hot until I pretended to reach into my pocket for a knife. And then as soon as I made that motion, he made an impressively quick sharp turn and sped off in the other direction. Again, it's not the creepiest thing, but it's still one of the more strange things that I've had happen. I couldn't tell you what his motive was. I had no idea if he wanted to jump me or rob me. Not a clue. This second encounter is a bit more unsettling. I was walking home from what my job was at that time. I worked at a Wendy's around the corner from my house, 
and I just finished my first closing shift. I had noticed, about halfway down my street, there was a guy just standing almost in the middle of the road. As I got closer, I realized it was someone who actually lived at a house that was about six houses down from mine, and he'd gotten onto his knees and started muttering random words and quotes from actors and movies. I'm pretty sure he was just on something, but he was shouting and smiling like a manic person at one point. He ended up chasing some guy walking his dog right as I had looked back when I got to my front door. Hands down, some of the wackiest shit I've experienced. Several years ago, I walked a handful of blocks up the street from my partner's house to a convenience store to buy something to drink. It was about 11pm and I was trying to slide in there before the store closed. To set the scene, we lived in a transitory neighborhood that was chocked full of abandoned houses and crime, with a few occupied residences and businesses scattered about. There were zero streetlights or illumination. Envision a more compact version of the type of Detroit neighborhood exemplified in the movie Barbarian, and you won't be far off the mark. Looking back, the nighttime excursions to the store slash from my place to his were absolutely idiotic on my part, but after living in that environment for years, you just become accustomed to it. Anyway, it was one of my many foolhardy nighttime store trips. My partner, by then, would ask me not to do it, but I just ignored that. I wanted my drink. I got the few blocks up the street in the usual darkness, got my drink and left the store to head back. Outside the store, a guy was standing near the trash can, hassling everyone who came out, asking for money, cigarettes, and that kind of thing. I told him I didn't have anything and started to cross the parking lot and head back, but this guy sprang after me like a rabbit and grabbed a hold of my arm. He starts aggressively demanding that I go to a party with him and trying to steer me down the pitch black side street just beside the convenience store. He was probably six foot seven, crazy tall and really thin, with dreads all in his face, making it hard to even see what he looked like. His fingers bit into my arm and felt like they pinched a nerve. My heart starts pounding like crazy right away. I was used to brushing off this type of behavior, having lived in that neighborhood for several years by then, but this was way more aggressive than anything I'd faced so far. I shook my arm out of his grasp, told him I was heading to my partner's place, and it was only a few blocks down the street. I said that he was waiting for me. I said sorry in an attempt to placate him, and took off speed walking down the street as fast as I could. He called after me several times, and then I heard his quick footsteps as he decided to follow me down the street. By then, I could feel my heartbeat in my eyes. My mouth had gone dry, and I was almost hyperventilating with fear, trying to stay quiet so this asshole wouldn't hear me. I had this feeling that to show fear or to look back at him would cause him to react violently right away, so I just put on a burst of speed and tried to outwalk him. My legs were no match for his crazy long stride, and I could hear little pieces of rock and concrete crunching under his feet as he closed in on me. I literally felt like my heart would leap out of my chest or explode from fear. I tried to walk faster, but I could hear the guy right behind me. I could hear his breath in my ear, and I got this overwhelming feeling that he was going to grab me at any second, maybe with a weapon, and try to force me to walk wherever he wanted me to. The neighborhood is pitch black, and there's no real through traffic, not at night. If he wanted to force me to go with him, I'd be powerless, save for trying to run from him. But with his height advantage, I knew he'd catch me fast. Then I could see my partner's driveway, and him standing at the end of it, waiting for me. He had this terrible feeling and already worried constantly about me walking at night, so he'd come outside to wait for me. I saw that he had his crowbar in one hand, and then my nerve broke and I started sprinting towards him. 
and the tall guy behind me started to run after me. I reached the place where my partner stood and squeaked out, help, or something like that. I dove behind him and cowered, waiting for the tall guy to pull out a gun and shoot us both or start struggling with my boyfriend. It didn't happen. He gets right up in my boyfriend's face, standing way too close to him, and asks for a light. My boyfriend gives him one, holding the crowbar aloft in the other hand so that it was very visible. Then I grab a hold of him and yank him into the house, locking the door and absolutely losing it, sobbing and freaking out while trying to choke out what happened. My boyfriend goes looking from the windows and sees him kind of standing around and then leaving. He saw him here and there for months afterward, up at the store or walking up and down the street. Unsurprisingly, I'm sure, I never took another nighttime walk. I still sometimes have nightmares about it. This is the late 80s, early 90s. I was around 6 to 7 years old. I'm at home with my sister, who's 14 to 15 at the time. We grew up in a small Texas town. Everyone knows everybody. We're home alone this particular night, and my folks let my sister babysit me frequently. We always got along due to our age gap. It's about 8pm in the winter, so it's dark, and we're in the common room since that's where the TV was watching 60 minutes or 48 hours or hard copy or some shit. It was one of those news pieces on CBS that chronicle large crimes and death, things like trafficking, murders, kidnappings and the like. Basically a gritty lifetime special. This one was a typical story. Guy next door that was quiet went on a rampage in his next door neighbor's house, mutilating them and kidnapping their young daughter. Well, the thing about our house common room is the door leading to the backyard was a large glass door on a wall of floor-to-ceiling windows. Nothing but blackness beyond it, unless you have the back light on, which we did not. The front door is on the other side of the room with a small entryway. This is a solid door, so you cannot see what's beyond it, with the glass storm door on the outside of it. About 45 minutes into the show, they're talking about the ongoing manhunt for this crazy guy and all of a sudden there's banging. It's coming from the front door. We jump the fuck up and scream like banshees. Dead silence now. The only lights on in the house are the kitchen down the hall from the common room we were in, and the light from the TV. We start thinking something on the porch had simply blown against the door. This was West Texas, crazy strong winds out that way. Well, a minute or two of silence and us holding each other post-adrenaline overdose passes. Just when we are about to declare everything is safe, we hear the storm door on the outside of our front door close. Fuck. Someone had to have opened the door to be able to bang on the front door like that. Shit. We're both frozen in the middle of the room, on the floor, where we've been watching TV. My sister crawls over to the TV and turns it off. It was an old TV, so you had to turn the metal dial to switch it off, which it does with a mildly loud thunk. Now it's just us in a room dimly lit by the kitchen light down the hall. I do not remember how much time passed with me frozen and my sister still crouched by the now off TV, but we kept making eye contact, then looking at the front door. I remember this part vividly. I'm on my knees, sitting on my feet, and I turn around to look at the back wall of windows and glass door. We hear, and I see, the back doorknob turn. It was locked on the knob, but not deadbolted. It rattles slightly, as if someone is gently trying the handle. Neither of us make a sound. We just held our breath, and then banging. Loud as hell as if someone's trying to force the door open, just jerking it back and forth. The whole wall of windows is vibrating violently, and I can see with each jerk of the door how my slight reflection gets fuzzy, then clear, and then back to fuzzy. 
My sister flips her shit and screams bloody murder. I'm still frozen on the floor. She gets up and basically drags me into her bedroom, slams the door, and throws her mattress and anything she can in front of her door. Thankfully, she'd remembered the phone. One of those ungodly heavy, beige plastic, long metal antenna portable phones. We still had to direct dial the sheriff there, and in her panic, she didn't remember the number. She just hit redial on the phone. It was one of her friends, and she tells them in broken gasps that someone is trying to get into our house, and they need to get there right now. I'm curled up on the floor and cannot stop shaking. We don't hear anything else until we see the lights of my sister's friend and her parents driving up to the house. We never did find out who was at the door or why. There was no signs that anything happened, except a couple of scuff marks at the bottom of the back door that we couldn't remember if they were there beforehand or not. Nothing like that has happened to me or her since, but we for damn sure never forgot to lock a door after that. I grew up in Wolverhampton in the West Midlands, UK. I was 12 years old, and let's just say I didn't have the easiest of upbringings. I was smoking, drinking, and staying out late around this time of my life. So I was bunking off of school, my mom was at work, and it was late morning time around 11am. I wanted to buy some cigarettes, but as I was well under the legal age, I had to hang around outside the shop and ask strangers if they would take my money and purchase them for me. About a mile and a half from my house, there was a little shop called the Spar. It was on a fairly busy road. A row of hedges lined one side, with a gap that led into the field beyond, and houses on the opposite side. So I was standing maybe 15 paces from the shop, waiting for people to walk past so I could ask them to purchase my cigarettes. I usually second-guessed if they would be willing by how they looked. I asked a lady, maybe mid-forties, shoulder-length blonde hair, black business trousers, pink elbow-length jumper, looked like she smoked, and she said no. I asked a guy, maybe mid-fifties, shaved brown hair. He was wearing blue jeans and a white t-shirt. He ignored me. So I was getting desperate by this point and decided upon asking anybody that came by. Then I see a rather disheveled looking man coming up the road towards me, past the row of hedges. He was wearing dirty dark brown suit trousers and a button up dark brown dirty velvet jacket. He had a black bowler kind of hat on and he kind of limped a bit as he walked. As he got closer to me and I was trying to suss out if he looked like the type that would possibly purchase a 12 year old cigarettes. I noticed he was probably homeless and possibly in his late 50s to early 60s. But I thought, hey, he probably smokes, I'll ask him. As he approached me, I gave him the usual line. Excuse me, mate, would you please go into that shop and get some cigarettes for me? He stopped and thought for a second, then said, How old are you? I lied. I'm 15, almost 16. And he said, all right, which ones do you want? And held out a really dirty hand. I gave him my money and asked him to get some ten sovereign. I had the exact change. He goes into the shop and I'm waiting outside excited. I'm finally getting my cigarettes and can go home and chill out before I have to leave the house again to make it look like I've just got home from school. He comes out and gives me twenty sovereign. I miffed to say the least and say, but I only gave you enough money for ten, and I start panicking because I don't have any extra money on me to give him. At this point, he hooks my arm in his, holding my arm firmly to his side, and starts to walk back towards the hedge-lined road. All the while, he's telling me how I can make up for not having the extra money for the cigarettes. I'm kind of stunned at this point, and my mind is blank. I guess I was in some kind of shock. He leads me through a gap in the hedges and into the field, all the while talking non-stop, still briskly walking with my arm locked in his. 
He's telling me how I can come to his house and help him fix the roof tiles. I'm still in silent shock. The field is huge, and I can see it leads into more fields and more fields. I can hear the cars behind me getting more distant. I can't see any houses for miles. There's just fields. He's still talking, but I'm not taking in what he's saying. My mind starts to race. I finally realize something about this isn't quite right, and I have to get away. As he's walking, still holding my arm, I suddenly and violently pull back, with my arm straight. My arm slides out of his very quickly, and he goes flying forwards and lands in a heap on the floor, and I take one big step backwards. I'm terrified at this point, but still in shock. I can't speak. He's laying on the ground, groaning and holding his leg. It's like he's in a lot of pain. Why do you do that for? You've really hurt me. Help me up. Help me up. He's holding his leg and puts his hand out for me to help him up. I'm frozen. My mind is racing so fast. I'm looking at this disheveled man right now in the eye, laying on the ground, groaning like he's in pain but something about this situation didn't sit right with me. My gut was telling me to run. Don't help him. I bought you those cigarettes, didn't I? I helped you out. Why did you do this? You've hurt me. Help me up. I take another step backwards, all the while looking into his green eyes. All of a sudden he stops groaning and asking for me to help him up. He points his finger at me, looking me right in the eye, and says, You're a smart girl. It was like an electric shock ran through my body, and I turn and run. I don't look back, I just run as fast as I can. When I'd gotten off the hedge-lined road and turned into the next road, I slow down as I'm out of breath. I start bawling my eyes out, and I'm shaking uncontrollably. I keep checking behind me catch my breath, and don't stop running until I get home. At the very least, I was terrified I'd bump into that man again, and I never tried to buy cigarettes from that shop ever again. Each year around this time, I open up my time hop app and I'm reminded of a night three years ago. Photos of softball sized black and blue bruises all over the right side of my body come up. I'm honestly somewhat thankful for that because it could have been much worse. I'll just never know. Three years ago, after a blackout Wednesday night with friends, I found myself locked out of my partner at the time's apartment at around 3 a.m. She was out with co-workers doing the same after her serving shift ended. We live in a big city, so I'd taken the train from where the night ended with my friends straight to her place and decided I'd just wait for her rather than head back home as the commute would be another half hour or so and my phone was dying. I was honestly just ready to sleep. In hindsight, I obviously just should have headed to my own apartment that night. After multiple texts and phone calls from me to her to come home, my partner being thoroughly annoyed with me was not in any rush to end their night. Drunk and upset, I sat inside the entrance gate to her apartment community and sulked. It was raining and cold, and I was exhausted. Putting myself in this situation all alone was my parents' worst nightmare, but at this point my phone was dead. I didn't have enough cab money, and there was no way in hell I was walking 15 minutes back to the train to head to my own apartment. A few minutes later, a man in a ski mask, sunglasses, and an oversized parker walks up to me. I remember him so vividly asking, Are you okay? I responded that I was fine and to please stay away from me. I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I thought, for a split second, he was genuinely concerned. I mean, here I was, a college-aged girl, sitting outside in the rain at 3am, 
completely alone. But at 3 a.m., you don't just approach a girl dressed like that and mean no harm. He then brandished an exacto knife and then asked, You sure you're okay? He picked me up with one hand while repeatedly striking at the back of my hood with the knife. All I could do was scream. I know I asked him why he was doing this, but I couldn't even bring myself to pull out the mace in my coat pocket. I was so stunned. Talk about fight, flight, or freeze. I don't know if it was a car that drove by or my screaming that caused him to stop, but after the longest 30 seconds or so of my life, he threw me to the ground and ran, leaving me with those awful aforementioned bruises. I'll be forever grateful for the thick hood on my coat. That came away with some knife cuts. Had my hood not been up, he would have absolutely sliced the back of my neck and head. My partner pulled up in a cab a few minutes later. At least I think it was a few minutes later. It was really a blur. I definitely went into a state of shock. We called 911 from her charged phone, stayed awake for the police to come and take a report, but we didn't hear much else afterward. There's a decent amount of crime in my city, so I wasn't really expecting much to come of it. What scares me the most is that number one, I still don't know what the man wanted. Number two, he knows what I look like and I have absolutely no idea what he looks like. And number three, I'm pretty certain I was followed all the way from the transit station to the apartment complex, which was a fairly long walk. Those three reasons still give me chills. Ski Mask Man, let's not meet again. When I was a teenager, I used to go out camping by myself. I had a spot where I liked that was across a few fences from my grandparents' house in the middle of nowhere. One of the places I cut through was a pasture full of cattle. Around cattle, especially cattle unfamiliar with me, I try to be very careful to not spook them, but otherwise, cows are pretty easy going. This was about a mile from my grandparents' house, and probably about two from my destination. The one time I remember, I slipped through the fence to find the cattle already freaked out. They were insanely agitated about something I was not aware of, so I stayed well clear of them as I went through the pasture. I had a good time camping that night and packed up the next morning. As I went back into that pasture, however, it was this ridiculously bad smell. It smelled like a skunk had fought with something in a fertilizer barrel of shit, and the barrel broke open. It was awful. I tried to look around for the cows to make sure they were not going to surprise me, and I could not find them. They were just gone. There was some brush and trees, though, so I thought they were just out of sight. I keep walking through the place to get home, and the smell is so bad that I set my stuff down at the fence line and decide to investigate. Well, I found the cows. All of them were shot and ripped apart. Someone had carefully shot them in the head with a bolt gun style thing and eviscerated all of them. It also drug them all into a little shallow ravine and piled the bodies up. It was horrible. I hightailed it out of there back to my gear. My stuff was gone, as in I set it right here on this rock, and it's not with an eye shot. A quick glance showed me there was not anything ripped out or fallen out, so something, or someone, had picked it up while I was 200 yards away for less than 5 minutes. I think Usain Bolt would not have been able to catch me on the way home. I've never heard anything else about those cows, and I did not go back to the old camping spot again. I hope you enjoyed that guys. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. 
I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Lavina Cordelia, Kirby Harris, Angie Linda, Rebecca James, Mason Hayes, Chelsea Moffat, Lisa Prentice, Michelle and Kevin, Amanda M, Rebecca Morris, Jennifer, Jessica Lasley, Brock Bollard, Kim Thompson, Angela Reeves, Sherry Agbehi, Nathan Shadwick, Nicholas Johnson, Samantha Place, Cheryl Duckworth, Scoutmonk405, Z Harris, Unladylike13, Ventura CA, Elizabeth Mayers, Alexia Tuttle, Marshana Rainey, Yolo Sapien, Mary Wright, Jessica Copperfield, Zoe D, Danielle Scholl, Jane Wiggins, Tara Harris, Mary Wright, Callie Townsend, M, Deshaun Edmondson, Kimmy Love, Wendy Maris, Confessions of a Cleaner, Megan Abrams, Miss Tycoon, Stephen Sloan, Christina Myway, Ashley Bray, Matt is a Felter, Danielle, Tina Marie Heckman, Amal Garner, Lisa Radford, Deborah Malays, Connie Sue, Taya Adwell, Diana Johnston, Vampy Debs, Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdowski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tierra Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel De Luna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Kuro, Amber Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Cami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Place 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasps Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Lainey, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Ardiver, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keaton, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Draco, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, 
Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.